Welcome to today's episode of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Ooh, do we have a good show for you today. Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey are our featured guests. We have them for the entire hour. How exciting. And so uh, stay tuned. We're going to be talking about excerpts from their latest book, The Entrepreneurial Culture, 23 Ways to Engage and Empower Your People. But before we do that, I'd like to let you know that our show is brought to you by our advertisers, Center Club, Community Bank, Decision Toolbox, Executives Unlimited, MBN Design, SNH Rubber, Strategic Market Intelligence, Sunup Group, TN Company, Tone Software, Turn Up the Volume, and UPS Protection. The goal for this show is to help you, our listening audience of CEOs who are running middle market firms, to improve your decision making skills. If you'd like to connect with me on LinkedIn, I'm Richard Rick Franzi. CEO Peer Groups is my Twitter handle. And on your favorite podcasting software, type in these four words Critical Mass Radio Show, and you'll be able to get our weekly uploads of our radio shows as a podcast. Also, don't miss our YouTube channel, Richard Franzi. It gives me great pleasure to welcome two guests in the studio, Bonnie Harvey and Michael Houlihan. Welcome both of you back to the studio. Thank you, Rick. We are delighted to be here. Yeah, fun to be here. It's great to have you back here. Before we get too far into the interview, um, let's start by setting your entrepreneurial pedigree. Uh, tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial background and sort of the genesis for your two books that you've written, but let's start with your entrepreneurial career. Well, our career started some time ago. Michael and I were both business consultants, and we were living in Sonoma County, the wine country, and I had clients. I was helping them to organize their offices and their inventory, and um, from that, I took that experience, which resulted in my seeing that I had a client that was owed a good deal of money, and that kind of allowed us to take advantage of an opportunity that was presented to us and that's how we started Barefoot Wines was due to an opportunity that we saw and um, we went with it. So you started Barefoot Wines. Michael, what happened after you started Barefoot Wines? Oh my gosh. We had to give up everything else, that's for sure. It became all-consuming. Uh, yeah, it was uh, definitely all-consuming. Uh, what we'd done was uh, in order to uh, solve uh, her client's debt, we traded out goods and services for the debt with a bankrupt company. Then we had the goods and services. Well, that didn't do him any good. So then we had to create a company to take the goods and services, create a label, and actually market the goods and services in a finished product uh -huh. on the market. Okay. And then take the money and pay them off. And we thought, oh, well, this will only take a year or two. Well, it took four or five years. and. You know, we, we thought, uh, how hard could it be? Right. Uh, it was a very difficult situation. Uh, we learned a lot of lessons. And in fact, those are the lessons that are wrapped up in the new book, The Entrepreneurial Culture, because uh, we work with a lot of corporations and they're always saying, you know, can you just give me some cut and paste ideas that entrepreneurs are doing every day that I can use in my corporation? And so we thought about it, and we distilled them out of our old, our first book, which was called The Barefoot Spirit, which is basically the story of how Barefoot gets started by two people, Bonnie and I, mm -hmm. in our laundry room. We don't know what we're doing. We don't have any money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but we blunder through. We learn these lessons the hard way. Right. So we took those lessons, and we put them in this book called The Entrepreneurial Culture. And... Uh, it's amazing uh, the reception that we're getting. Uh, a lot of the big corporate people, like uh, the C-Suite Conference, they love it and mm -hmm. they recommend it, and the CEO uh, Forum, they recommend it. So we're pretty happy, and we wrote it for for C types, as okay. Bonnie says. You know, all the C's and the and the uh, VP and the VP and even the P. <laughs> yeah. So so basically, everybody <laughs> who's, soup everybody here. that's yeah. got a suit on can read this book. Um, but we designed it to be one airplane ride. I love that. You know, it's yeah. it's less it's a little over a quarter of an inch thick. Right. It's about a hundred pages. You can read the whole thing on one airplane ride. You go to San Francisco and you you got the twenty three ideas. That's fantastic. So, uh I'm talking with Bonnie Harvey and Michael Houlihan. We're talking about, we're going to get into some of the content, but before I do that, um, you're listening to Critical Mass Radio Show, and I'm your host, Rick Franzi. Why are you both, we have you in the studio, why are you here in Southern California this week? Well, actually, it was a number of reasons. It started off with the University of California at Long Beach asking Michael if he would be the distinguished alumni for the year. Wow. So that got us started here, and then we've we've managed to get a number of other engagements since we were here, including this one. Right. And we're also speaking at um, UCLA. UCLA. 
mm-hmm. to their business school. Uh, to- and we're speaking to their uh, business club and to their wine appreciation club. Nice. And they're also bringing in their marketing club and whatnot. So it's going to be a, a great group of students. Uh, many of them are graduate students. So we're going to have an opportunity to talk with them. We're very excited about that. And then on Friday, we're going down to see our friends at the Surfrider Foundation mm-hmm. in, in uh, Santa Clemente. Mm-hmm. And of course, the Surfrider Foundation is a nonprofit organization. They're the only people who are testing the ocean water for your safety every day. Really? The government doesn't do it. I Surf riders do it. Really? They test the water. Well, few people know that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, few people realize that. And we've been big supporters of Surf Rider for what? Since 1991, I think? One or two, yes. Okay. Yeah. So we've seen them go from three chapters here in Southern California to now they're worldwide. Right. And uh, they have chapters all over the world, and they're committed to clean beaches. They're com- uh, committed to saving the waves, you know, saving the, the surf. Right. And they're also committed to clean ocean. Oh, Surf so, Rider Foundation. Yeah, Surf Rider. So if someone wanted to learn more about them, they just probably Google the word Surf Rider Foundation, and they can learn more about that worthy organization. Yeah, that's it. That's excellent. All right. Well, let's let's start talking about some of the content that's in the entrepreneurial culture 23 ways to engage and empower your people Um, what are the five tips to creating an exceptional customer experience because we're going to be we're going to be talking about the difference between customer service and complaint resolution which i think is a very important area and as an entrepreneur you have to be very sensitive to customer service right whether you're in a service business or a product business so let's start by asking you to share a little bit about the five tips for creating exceptional customer service bonnie would you like to start well when we're talking about a customer that's calling in and saying that i've got a problem or somebody that sends your your company an email or something there's a number of things that you can do besides give them their money back which we don't think is such a good idea. Okay. One thing is you give them product or service, whatever it was that they say they were unhappy with. You you say, give me a chance to show you what we can do. Okay. So let me let me replace your product and, and show you how great our stuff is and how wonderful our service is. So that's one way. That way you've got somebody who's going to be happy and content with your product or service rather than somebody that says, well, I had a problem with them because people are going to talk. Right. If they're... Uh, If they're inclined to give you a call in the first place, then they really care about your product, or why would they even bother? So if they're going to call you, they're going to be talking to their friends and their family about your response as well. So make sure that they're happy with your product and service Mm -hmm. instead of not happy. And the other thing you can do is uh, start a conversation with them. I mean, these people took the time. Yes, they're calling to complain, but you're their product they want to see their complaints get to your production people they want to see their complaint get to your marketing people so the issue is how does that happen is your company just like we say looking at uh, customer service as complaint resolution or are they really seeing it as customer intel Mm. so we say start a conversation and what happens with a conversation is you find out where did you buy it was it the price you expected was it in stock uh, you know, do you normally buy it there? Um, w- what was your experience with the product? Did it live up to your expectations? Uh, do your friends use the product? This kind of intelligence is just absolutely priceless. Right. You've got the and look at the money that the companies spend on trying to find this information out with these focus groups. Yeah, and then you have a live, real customer right on the phone who's called you. Right. Well, Couldn't why, be better. Why not data mine that, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and Bonnie, are you saying to empower the person who's on the phone, who's making that one-to-one customer connection with the ability to offer free products and services? Or Oh, yes. That's, that's very important because that shows um, that you as a boss or an owner are trusting that person that's taking the call to make some good decisions. So that's kind of an entrepreneurial attitude that you enable your, your own staff to make the best decision for that customer. Right. And by giving them that kind of a trust, they feel like they're more part of the company. They're not reading a script. Every individual is different. So it's got to be very personal with whoever's on the other end of the line or even the email string. Right. And I I would sense many times if you're calling in and you're frustrated, if that person can't solve your problem they have to talk to someone else that is all that almost feels like it's a dodge even oh, yeah. you know if, if you're what then why am i talking with you right yeah. i've just wasted my time is, right. is what the caller feels right. exactly you're not really serious about helping me are you you're just slowing me down it's sort of like calling through those call trees you know press one oh, for boy. this two for that by the time you get to the person you're on 
phone already for multiple minutes, and it seems uh, to be... Nobody likes that. That's no not good customer service. That's bad customer service. Absolutely. Isn't? We're talking with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. There are many things, including accomplished authors now and respected and well-known people in the wine industry and now as entrepreneurs and giving back to the uh, worldwide entrepreneurial culture, aren't you? Absolutely. Trying to help people. So we're going to take our first break here on Critical Mass Radio Show. Don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be back in just a few short minutes. I'm going to ask them to share the big... Richard Franzi is the author of two popular business books for CEOs. His first book, Critical Mass, The Ten Explosive Powers of CEO Peer Groups, was the first book ever written on the secret value of CEO peer groups. His second book, now with newly updated information, is Critical Mass, The Power of CEO Guiding Principles. Richard's books contain powerful information to help CEOs running middle market companies gain valuable insight to improve their decision-making skills. Richard's books are available as paperbacks or Kindle versions from Amazon.com. To find them, type Richard Franzi in the search box. Are you looking for your successor? Someone as dedicated and experienced in their field as you? Executives Unlimited delivers the top executive talent you need for your company's long-term success. 98% of our clients re-engage us for additional hires, and over 90% of the executives placed by us since 2007 are still in their positions or have been promoted. That's twice the industry's average retention rate. How do we do this? Dedication. Executives Unlimited believe success isn't success until it's long-term. Call us to invest in your long-term success. 562-627-3800 or visit us at executivesunlimited.com. Let our long-term success leverage yours. Award-winning photographer David Moyle has more than 16 years of experience creating unique and riveting photography for his clients. Whether your business is an international corporation or a small business, David Moyle's photography can make you stand out. Visit www.davidmoyle.com or call 714-272-2284. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. We had a little interesting intro there from our engineer, Paul Roberts. Thanks, for Paul, for keeping it fresh. Always asking for a gong show on which I found from. Thank goodness. So we're talking about the book, The Entrepreneurial Culture, 23 Ways to Engage and Empower Your People, written by Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. They've also uh, wrote the book, um, which I have this right here, copy of, The Barefoot Spirit, which is the story of how hardship, hustle, and heart built America's number one wine brand. So we have the Barefoot Wine founders who are now giving back to the corporate world and to entrepreneurs and students with some of the lessons that they've learned. When we were off mic during the commercial, we were having an interesting conversation about the definition of who a customer is, maybe the expanded definition of, of a customer. So could you guys give our audience a sense for how, who you view a customer to be? Yes, um, we always felt that a customer was essential. Customers are on top. Okay, first of all, you're always trying to satisfy your customer, but the customer is not just the end user of your product or your service. What right. the customer is, it's anybody that touches your product. It could be your supplier. In our case, it was also our distributors. It was our retailers. It was anybody that had to do with our product. Mm -hmm. And we had to satisfy their needs. We had to understand how they were best, com how to best communicate with them in order to get the job done. So it's really putting yourself in the other guy's shoes with everyone that's a part of your company, whether they're supplying your product or service uh, or using it in any way, shape, or form, or um, anybody that has to do with your company, with your business, is your customer. And so they all have different needs. They do have different needs, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. And different forms of communication. Right. You have anything to add to that, Michael? Well, I, I just want to say that uh, for us, we were in the consumer products business, so yes. we're producing a product like so many of your listeners are and trying to sell it through a distribution system. Well, the worst customer experience in the world is they love your product, they go to the store, and it's not there. See, and it isn't your fault that it's not there. Right. It could be the retailer's fault. It could be the distributor's fault. It could be the truck driver's fault. There's a lot of reasons why your product isn't there. But who are they going to blame? They're going to blame you. 
So you, as the producer, have to take it upon yourself and all your employees to understand the complete distribution chain. Hmm. Everybody who's involved in what everybody wants to know in order to do their job. And they're sold for different reasons. These people, they don't, in our case, we were selling wine. Nobody cared about wine. <laughs> it was such a surprise to us. <laughs> you know, the guy, the guy that owned the <laughs> distributorship, he didn't care about wine. What he wanted to know was, well, have you already sold a big supermarket that's in my territory so I can boost my income? Uh -huh. And then the guy who was his manager, he wanted to know, well, do you guys have a representative in this territory that will sell the product if my guys don't do it? Mm. And then his guys, the salespeople, they wanted to know how much was in it for them. They didn't care about the, the wine. For the what, was, what was the incentive? Right. And then they also wanted to know if our guy was going to sell the retailer for them. So, and then the retailer, he wanted to know if other retailers were having success with the product. And then we had to sell his clerk. And his clerk wanted to know if we thought he was important. What and do you mean by that? Well, he's the clerk. He's getting paid a flat rate whether or not our product sells. Right. There's virtually no financial interest in whether it sells or not, which means what's his motivation to go in the back room and get it and put it back on the shelf? Yeah, because he's the last link to your customer, yeah, right? To the end customer. Yes, exactly. And, and exactly. what's his motivation to say, Mrs. Jones, you really should try this product? Mm. You know, and the motivation is that our guy went in there and gave him a baseball cap with a big you know, foot on it in our case, right. or maybe took him to lunch and said, you know, Bill, you're really important to this whole chain here. This is where the rubber meets the road. You're the most important person on this chain. So we're making him feel important. We're showing respect for this guy. Right. Then he get, then he sells to the general public. Now you have the opportunity to sell the general public. What, what most companies do is they focus on the general public and they forget all those people they have to go through with their needs and their, their employees have no idea. Yeah, that's what I was going to say because you have to kind of educate the entire company, oh, yeah. right? All your, all your internal employees are barefoot to, to understand the different levels and, and customers you have to kind of work through to get to the end user. So our entire staff was involved with customer care and customer customer satisfaction. Okay. So that they would, what, become empathetic to that or get first-hand knowledge of dealing with customers? Exactly. So they could best do their own job because we had a lot of contracted services. So they were responsible for getting the job done. Our staff was, but they had to rely on other people. Right. So they had to work with those people to make sure that they were communicating properly, so they understood the lead times that were necessary, and do they want it in writing or verbal, and how often to check back with them, and all of these things to make sure the job gets done. And it gets more confusing as you grew, too, right? Oh, yeah. I mean... Oh, yeah. It, it, <laughs> but the more they know about the process, the better it is for your company culture. And the better your company culture is, and we say all good company culture is based on sales. Okay. So the idea is if everybody on the team, I don't care what they do, I don't care if it's a lawyer, I don't care if it's a receptionist, if they understand that their paycheck is made up of sales, right? and they understand how those sales get there, they're going to be more likely to help you make it happen. Mm. And that's what we found out. Because they understand that all goodness comes from the sale, selling part of the They understand business. that the customer is totally on top. Right. You know. <laughs> well, we're talking with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey, uh, accomplished authors. We're just pulling some of the content of their latest book, The Entrepreneurial Culture, out. 23 Ways to Engage and Empower Your People. Uh, so I said before the break we were going to talk about the biggest difference between the mm -hmm. focus and the concept of customer service and the uh, understanding of complaint resolution. So from your experience, can you share for the people listening in our audience today, either live or maybe on iTunes or one of our other podcasting services, how do you differentiate those two terms? Well, you have to remember that uh, many companies relegate uh, what they call customer service uh, to a role of complaint resolution. So the way it works in most companies is it's top down. They start with, you know, maybe raw materials. They have raw materials. They want to sell them, so they make a product. Uh, then they want to market the product, so they have the marketing people come up with a marketing plan. And then they push that down on the salespeople, and they say, use this marketing plan and go out and sell this product. And then if there's any complaints, then they call it into the customer service department. Right. Well, we don't even like that term. We call it customer care or better yet, customer intel. Okay. So the difference is if you relegate those folks to a low level of status in your company along with sales, how can you possibly say you put the customer on top when you're putting sales and customer service on the bottom? Right. You can't. 
And basically, that's a top-down attitude. We like the bottom-up attitude where the person who is actually talking to the customer every day is your salesperson and your customer care person. They're the only two people in your company that talk to them every day. Mm -hmm. So they know more than all of the studies, all the focus groups, and all of the marketing gurus put together. They can tell you in a minute whether or not that piece of marketing material is going to work or whether that particular product is going to go. Because they have a relationship with these people. And that's the difference. The difference is that when you start to look at customer service as real service, and I don't care if you're selling a product or a service, we're all in the service business. Right. And the service that we're really selling here is the service of trust. We're saying, if you buy my product, you can trust that we're going to stand behind it. Mm -hmm. And we're going, to, we're going to treat you right if you have a problem. Bonnie, did you want to add to that? Well, I just want to bring back that... Um, <coughs> Complaint resolution really is, is completely different than customer satisfaction or customer care. And um, once again, it has to do with every member of the staff. We didn't have a department that was the customer care or the complaint resolution department. Once again, it was everyone on our staff that was responsible for that. So it really s creates a feeling of teamwork. It really creates a feeling that you you're all have the same goals in mind. And you realize with this kind of an attitude, which is really an entrepreneurial attitude, right. that um, it takes everyone on the team to succeed. And the team, again, goes beyond just who is ever in your office or whoever is the salespeople out there, but it's everyone that you're doing business with. It's, it, it's easy then if you have a customer care, call it what you will, department for the rest of the company to sort of wash their hands of that then. Is, I, that's kind Sorry. of what I hear you saying without saying it, it. Yes. Bonnie, right? Where if you make everybody a p responsible for that, then they can't shirk their responsibility in doing, in doing what needs to be done. Because many times, complaint resolution, customer service, customer care has to be done by departments other than the department that's called that. Exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. One of the things that we did that, that your listeners can use as a tactical tool um, is we would have meetings, quarterly meetings. We'd bring in the salespeople and we'd bring in the customer care people. And we would sit the marketing people down and we would sit the production people down. Okay. And we would turn to the people who were talking to our customer every day and say, Tell us what's wrong with it. <laughs> tell us how we're selling. Have yeah, <laughs> yeah. us. Tell us tell us right. how we can improve this picture. And then w the way that we enforced it, another tactical thing is the f the 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 four hundred one k company match uh -huh. could either be fifty percent, a hundred percent, or one hundred and fifty percent based on sales growth and profitability of the company. Wow. So now you had people who were in production or administration or the receptionist or you name it, marketing. And all of a sudden, it was very important to them to find out what customer care had to say and, and what the salespeople had to say. Right, because that enables growth, which then benefits them in the long run, right? Exactly. Through the 401k. Exactly. How, did you, mm -hmm. how did you come up with the idea to use the 401k as an instrument for that? We like the idea that it was, uh, that it was a 90-day period. A lot of companies, they try to bonus people on a year. Mm -hmm. It's too long. People can't remember that long. Right. Uh, and a month is great, but you're going to get a lot of pushback from your accounting guys. They're going to say, oh, I can't give you those numbers that fast. Right. But a quarter, they can do a quarter. Right. And so people can work on a quarter, and they're not going to sandbag you either because it's so short of a time. Right. So, or they, and they're not going to give up, you know, if they make their number. Nice. All right, we're talking with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. Uh, the time's flying by. I just saw from my producer that we have to take our next commercial break here. So when we come back, I'm going to ask you how customer service reps can transform unhappy customers into a term brand advocates. So let's let's talk about that in a minute because I, I think there's a powerful opportunity to do that, isn't there? And, and I actually have a recent story kind of in that vein as well. So don't go anywhere, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to be back with these two noted entrepreneurs after these words from our commercial sponsors. <laughs> Today's businesses are embracing voice over IP telephones and unified communication desktop technologies to more effectively communicate and collaborate with their customers, suppliers, and colleagues. The Reliatel management software from Tone Software Corporation helps organizations of all sizes manage their communications technologies to ensure great voice quality and better levels of service and reliability throughout their business. Through Reliatel, you'll gain higher return on investments from VoIP and unified communications technologies while lowering the associated operational support and maintenance costs. Learn more. Visit www.tonesoft.com 
or call 800-833-8663 for information on Reliatel by Tone Software, the solution for quality business communications. If you are an Orange County business executive, this message is for you. Do you ever feel isolated with no place to turn for advice or feedback? Who holds you accountable to your commitments in your company? Where do you find the right resources to help you and your company grow? If you have these questions, then Critical Mass for Business might be the answer for you. Critical Mass for Business is committed to helping you make better decisions. These are groups of peers running businesses just like you, providing a great sounding board to test ideas and concepts, review plans and goals, and present issues and opportunities for discussion. The result is improved strategy, accountability, people, and execution skills. If you are interested in learning more, go to www.criticalmassforbusiness.com and learn more about our executive peer group. UPS Protection has been protecting systems in the U.S. against brownouts, blackouts, and poor quality power for over 25 years. We provide power protection systems, including UPS, lighting inverters, generators, and service for clients from coast to coast. We specialize in solving all your power needs. As a direct reseller of the best brands in the industry, including Liebert, Powerware, and APC, we can solve all your power protection needs. Protecting your power is our main goal. We offer on-site or depot repair of our critical equipment. To better serve your budget constraints, UPS Protection also offers both reconditioned and new products. There you go. Welcome back to Critical Mass Radio Show. I'm your host, Rick Franzi. Bonnie Harvey and Har- Michael Houlihan are our guests. We're talking about excerpts from their book, The Entrepreneurial Culture. Uh, before we get back to talking to them, I just want to remind you or let you know that all of our shows can be heard anytime from iTunes, Stitcher.com, Spreaker.com, literally several hundred former radio show guests on their website. Uh, maybe their CEO has been on our show and they put the interview on their website as well as other business oriented podcasting services. Each month we reach several thousand uh, listeners through our podcast on iTunes and the other medium. If you'd like to listen to us on a regular basis, either listen to us live here on octalkradio.net or any one of the podcasting services that I mentioned before. Okay, well, we're back, and before the break, as I was going to ask them to share a story or their experience of how you take an unhappy customer and create a brand advocate. So, Bonnie, would you would you like to get us started in that conversation? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, well, first of all, you want to let a caller know when they're calling in with a complaint or a comment how important it is to you to have the opportunity to talk with them, because this way you're actually talking. This is your focus group. It was in our company. And this way we're taking the information that they give us and we're giving it on to our production company or production department and our marketing department to improve our products and services to them, the customer. And that's essential. How else would we get that information unless we talk to the end user or all the customers? So, so are you so, suggesting thanking them for calling to complain? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. It's a wonderful opportunity. Right. And at the same time, you've got an opportunity to ask them a lot of other questions, like where they bought the product, how much it was, how often they buy the product. In our case, we'd ask them which one of our varietals they like the most. One thing is a lot of times the complaint that they'd come in with was that they couldn't find our product wow. in their market anymore. Well, that complaint would go right to our distributor. Right. And then our distributor would realize there's people out there that really do want our product and they'd try a, a little harder to get our product back on the shelf. Right. One of the be- worst problems that we had was we were a fast seller. That meant that we <laughs> would be selling off the shelf and there wouldn't be any more product there. Imagine that. That's a problem, <laughs> huh? But that is, I, was, can see, yes. I can see how very much that is. Then you have people who could then switch, right? And I imagine once they switch, maybe they're not easy to get back or... That's a very good point. Yes, it is. And that's why when they do have a complaint about your product, it's more important that you show them how you can give them a great product by giving them more of your product, not their money back. Mm. Okay. Because they're going to keep talking, too. Right. They're going to talk to their friends and their family about how they were treated by you. Well, that's powerful. Michael? I was just going to say that when somebody takes the time to call you with a complaint, they represent at least 100 people who didn't call. Okay. They just walked. 
they just took another product. Right. And They're gone. And so, so you're very fortunate to get this person, and you shouldn't look at them as a complainer. You should look at this person as an information opportunity. So the other thing you want to do with this person is you want to treat them uh, with respect, and whatever they ask for, if you can't satisfy it, you take it in and you say, you know, that's a very good complaint. We're going to get back to you on this. We're going to talk to some people here and find out what we can do to solve this problem. Hmm. And that's really important because ultimately that's what they want. Again, this is a person who is very loquacious. That's why they're calling you. Well, wouldn't it be nice to have that kind of broadcasting ability singing your praises? There you go, the brand advocate piece. And people right. judge you not by how well you do when you're doing great, but how well you do when you messed up. Right. Because that that's when they know what kind of stuffing you really got. Wow. So we told all our people, when we get a complaint, this is your opportunity to shine. This is the opportunity to really build this company's reputation. Right. Because if a person calls and complains, and you satisfy them, they're going to go out and say, you know what happened when I got a bad bottle of wine from these guys? You know what happened? See? Right. And that's what you want. Well, you know, that's interesting because I, uh, uh, as I was mentioning, my son was recently married, and they had, he and his bride had an issue with the hotel getting, uh, they had lost their reservation. Let's just put it that way. The property didn't fly the flag anymore, so they couldn't use that property. And literally, I, uh, uh, I was spending hours on the phone with the hotel company trying to mm. find somebody who could solve this problem. And, and I ended up in the customer complaint department and they couldn't help me and, and it was very it was a very sour thing that I was feeling after all my years of loyalty with this brand yeah. until I found one gentleman who was empowered and was able to completely fix the problem and actually exceeded my expectations on what I was he did more than I was asking all the other people to do for me without me having to ask yeah, so, so, so he's turned the story from what was sour into one that I'm so glad that I'm loyal to them because there was at least one person who was entrepreneurial enough to figure out how to get around the systems that everybody else were constrained by customers want to validate their purchase they want to say, yes, I bought this brand, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Especially if they're loyal. They want a little bit of loyalty back. Oh, yeah. Right? Yes. Like you care about me, which mm -hmm. entrepreneurs have to do to survive in the marketplace, right? Absolutely. Corporations get, I'm going to kind of bring that into, you know, what's the number one corporate strategy corporations can use to engage and empower their customer care team to provide an exceptional service? Because I find sometimes when you get big, people get away from the customer. Uh, having worked for large yeah. multi-billion dollar corporations, it's it was amazing to me sometimes in the meetings that I would go to how little the customer voice was ever represented in the kind of decisions and conversations. So, you know, sometimes it's the king and his court or the queen and her court in the corporate world. It's not really the customer's voice anymore. So so what do you, you have a kind of key strategy that large corporations, bigger companies could use to... Well, what worked really well for us at Barefoot Wines was we'd have uh, monthly or quarterly meetings, like Michael had said, with the salespeople, with the customer care people, with our production people, and with our marketing people all in the same room. So we're hearing about what's going on in the marketplace, and you're not isolated and insulated from the different departments because it takes all departments working together. And that was a, a big way that we had, is we'd really discuss what was going on. And we always had the idea that we're in a constant state of improvement. Okay. It's not a matter of pointing a finger at who's doing something wrong, but it's really how can I improve the situation or what changes can I make, can I take control over to make this problem less likely to reoccur. And uh, that's how you grow, that's how you develop customer loyalties when the customers know that you're listening, you're paying attention, and what do you know? It shows up in your marketing, it shows up in your production. So production is not an isolated department, and nor is marketing. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add? Well, I was going to say that people who take the time to call and complain, once again, uh, need to be respected by large corporations. That start, that process of respect starts on day one. You don't just orient them by saying, here's where the bathroom is, here's where the coffee is, you know, here's where the forms are in the office if you hurt yourself. Right. This is your go-to person. That's not good enough. You have to say, here's the money map. 
It's a graphic money map. It shows the customer handing money to somebody to buy a product okay. that is either your product or you have a piece of that product as a company. And then it shows that money moving on to a distributor or to a wholesaler or a broker. And then what he does with the money. And then it moves on and it keeps moving back closer and closer. Finally comes to your company. But now this person who was just hired on day one, they see this and they go, oh my gosh. You mean to say that my paycheck has to go through all those hurdles to get here? Mm -hmm. This gives them a real uh, eye opener and respect for what is involved in them getting paid. So I like to bring it, always bring it back to the paycheck. If you want to get somebody's attention, bring it back to the paycheck. Say, this is where your paycheck comes from and show it to them graphically. Right. So I think that that's another thing big corporations can do. Yeah, because I, I think when you get size, you um, sometimes. Uh, forget how important the customer is to the business because you get fooled into believing that you're invincible or that you're you've attained some level of something that is you know you're not going to be damaged by a few dissatisfied customers and it's almost maybe their fault sometimes I've seen cultures where the a customer complaint is well, don't they understand well the, right? the other thing that seems to happen is they get carried away with the division of labor itself mm. and they start to look at each division as if oh you're in the engineering division you know, you don't have anything to do with sales or customer service. Right. Now, I don't want anything to do with sales, you know, you, right? You, yeah. just, you just write the applications, okay? You just do the coding. That's what you do. Right. And that attitude results in a real sour attitude toward the customer. You have to remember the customer service people, they're in a booth with headphones on all day. The salespeople, they're out in the field making sales. So who's around the CEO in the C-suite? It's everybody else. It's the marketing people, it's the production people, it's Finance. the administrative, the le legal people. And so they've got the ear of the top bosses. Right. So they can easily outvote the marketing people, I mean, outvote the sales people, and they can easily outvote the customer care people. Interesting. So that's why big corporations, they've allowed their division of labor to blind them to what is actually taking place, which is some customer somewhere is giving somebody some money for a product. That's so interesting, because when I had my issue with the hotel, I was talking to the complaint department before I found the gentleman who fixed it beyond my expectations. And I even said to her, I said, you know, if your founder were alive today yep. to see this conversation, I said, I can fully understand how your legal department and your finance department have decided this is the right thing for this corporation to do. But let me tell you, ma'am, if your founder was alive, he wouldn't stand for this. This is not customer service. Yep. And this, you're not, and I'm, and I'm. And I'm totally loyal to you for 30 years. What does that buy me in this one mm -hmm. instance? I'm sorry, sir. If I could do something, I can't. That is like you know what I very like? defeating. It, it, what I like is at the end of that conversation, they inevitably say, well, can I be of any other help? Yeah, you exactly. Can I, can, I, can I be of any further assistance? And they have an assistant. Yeah, no, no, yeah. Were you purposely saying that? To just <laughs> salt in the wounds? Well, it's, it's part it's of their script. On the script. <laughs> <laughs> the script, yes, the script. all right. Throw well, the script away, that would be another piece of advice, because everyone that calls in is an individual, and they have something very specific to say. You can have things that are facts, you can have things in front of you that would be resources, but not a script. It's very easy, if you're on the other side of that phone, to see that they're reading a script, mm -hmm. and that's insulting to people. Right. And, and I think people who are in the customer service world, who are dealing with the customers, on whether it's account manager or whatever, they are your brand. Right? I mean, Absolutely. that that's what you walk away from the, from the um, relationship remembering. Mm -hmm. It's not everything else. It's not the marketing messages and commercials and things. It's mm -hmm. that personal relationship you have with the people who you talk to. Yeah, yeah. it's the that's, real That's the, real the brand, brand image. It yeah. is. Yeah. All right. Well, we're talking with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. We're going to take our last commercial break here on Critical Mass Radio Show, and we're going to talk more about their book, The Entrepreneurial Culture, and we're going to do that after these words from our sponsors. <laughs> Successfully navigating the changing world of public relations and digital marketing requires an experienced, tenacious, yet gracious team. In business for more than 20 years, Orange County-based Tea & Company delivers big agency results with personalized service. For more information, call us at 714-536-8407 or visit us online at tandco.me. 
Today's businesses are embracing voice over IP telephones and unified communication desktop technologies to more effectively communicate and collaborate with their customers, suppliers, and colleagues. The Reliatel management software from Tone Software Corporation helps organizations of all sizes manage their communications technologies to ensure great voice quality and better levels of service and reliability throughout their business. Through Reliatel, you'll gain higher return on investments from VoIP and unified communications technologies while lowering the associated operational support and maintenance costs. Learn more. Visit www.tonesoft.com or call 800-833-8663 for information on Reliatel by Tone Software, the solution for quality business communications. Let's face it, not all company challenges are the same, which is why strategic market intelligence can help identify the actionable information you need to be more competitive. Gain a better understanding of your brand, competition, best prospects, or new product opportunities to generate greater revenues in 2015. Call 949-357-9547 or visit www.strategicmarketintelligence.com. Are you ready to tap into the power of social media to promote your business? It's easy to get social with Turn Up the Volume, the award-winning social media marketing professionals who know how to get results. Drive web traffic, boost sales, get social today. Visit www.turnupthevolume.com. That's turnupthevolume.com. Welcome back to this edition of Critical Mass Radio Show. I am your host, Rick Franzi. Bonnie Harvey and Michael Houlihan are our guests. They are noted entrepreneurs having founded, started, grew uh, Barefoot Wineries, the number one wine brand in America, as well as now authoring two books. And we're talking really about the content of their second book, which is really a, a how-to guide for larger companies, for entrepreneurs on how to bring 23 essential ideas back into that entrepreneurial spirit and your barefoot spirit into your company. So welcome back to the studio, Bonnie and Michael. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So um, how, let's let's talk about Barefoot for a minute, because I, I see here that you guys saved large budget normally spent on focus groups and you utilize customer feedback to exceed their expectations and develop new products and and solve so you didn't use the traditional as you grew marketing approach of focus groups talk talk to us a little bit about what you were doing that was different than that that got you closer to the customer real feedback we asked questions of everybody that touched our product and uh, in the process we learned things that you're not going to find out through a focus group um, when I say everybody that touched our product, we talked to forklift drivers, we talked to people on bottling lines, we talked to clerks in stores that were putting products on shelves, and we'd ask them, we'd say, what, what products do you like, what products do you not like, you know, what works best for you? What's a hard product for you to deal with? Oh, okay. And, and we knew that we had to get these people in line in order for us to just get our product right. to the customer. So that's sort of like sales channel friction that you're not even aware of if you're not asking about it, right? Right. Yeah, I don't like the way your boxes are because they're flimsy or whatever. Yeah. Or I delivered the wrong product because your products because your boxes all look the same. Uh oh. Okay. That's a good one, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so I messed up because you Yeah. Yeah. And and when I messed up, your product was out of stock and when it was out of stock, your customer bought something else. Right. Oh, and by the way, our clerk just told them that you don't make it anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just to get you back kind of thing, right, yeah. So so you can learn a lot just from listening and asking people who don't, maybe even don't even normally be asked their opinion then too, right? Oh, I mean, yes, absolutely. Another thing was that we did a lot of tastings. We did wine industry tastings, and we sponsored and, and helped out a lot of community fundraisers and nonprofits. So whenever our, somebody was tasting our product or coming to our booth for a taste of wine, we'd talk to them. We'd engage them. We'd say, what do you like about the product, the taste? What do you uh, like about the package? Where do you shop? What kind of price wines do you like? Is there another varietal that you would like to have? So we're really talking to the people. We're not setting them up and saying, we're conducting a survey and yes. we want to have your answers. But it's a real social occasion. And uh, people will freely tell you what they think uh, about your product and service. And so that way, we not only had our salespeople out there doing the nonprofits, but everyone in our office was also out there doing the fundraisers for the nonprofits and talking to the community. 
So while you were giving for a good reason, supporting the nonprofit, you were also gaining some uh, exposure and insight that you wouldn't have been able to get if you hadn't been there. Yes, that was our focus group, in addition to the people that were calling in on our 800 number. Uh-huh. Interesting. And the other thing we did is, um, you know, most companies are built like pyramids. Uh, you got the CEO on top, you got the vice presidents, you know, the, the senior vice presidents, the division chiefs, the department heads, the, the groups, the committees, yeah. you know. And um, we think that pyramids are really for dead pharaohs, you know, <laughs> so you have to really steer clear of those pyramids. We like the flat structure, and actually, we had a two division company. Uh, in our company, you were either in sales or you were in sales support. And sales support was everybody who was not in sales. And okay. that's the most unlikely person that would be like the accountant would be in sales support. You know, production, they would be in sales support. Marketing, sales support. The receptionist, the CEO, they're all in sales support. R&D. You know why? It's because they really are supporting sales when you right. take a look at it that's really what's going on so by setting the company up that way instead of this top-down idea we got a whole different attitude a whole different culture and that's that's why our book is called the entrepreneurial culture because the back the backbone of the entrepreneurial culture is customer on top sales and customer service is under the customer and then everybody else is under that. Right. So it's a very simple organizational structure. It's based on the flow lines, if you will, or this, this, the structure of the feedback. Mm -hmm. So the feedback loop, where does it go? It goes from the customer, it goes to the customer service people, or it goes to your sales people. Right. And then where does it go from there? Does it die there? In a lot of pyramids, it dies right there. Yeah, we used to call them the customer prevention department, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The well, legal, would... legal is the customer prevention department. <laughs> yeah, they could but, be very much. So. And finance, too. Finance could be very but much But you see, if, if legal gets a bonus based on sales, you'd be surprised how creative they could get. And did you ever see any... Um, Ramp, uh, any negative impact of that? Did, could could you overdrive that message too much in a company where you know sales is everybody's in support of sales? Did, w was it your experience ever that your sales department got out of control, or for any reason that was that that was counter to what you were trying to get done, or did it allow you to align the culture the way you wanted to at Barefoot Line? No, it really did help us align the culture because, um, like we said, the whole staff understood that they were working together as a team, and there was no purpose for their job if there wasn't a sale because if there's not a sale, there's no money to put into their paycheck. And after all, as much as they did enjoy their jobs, they were there to get a paycheck as well. Right. And it kind of dissolves the walls between the divisions of labor. Mm -hmm. So what it does is it promotes uh, intramural communication, if you will. Instead of, uh, I've got a piece of information, you need to do your job, I'm going to tell you, but I want to make sure that you invite me to lunch with Mr. Big next mm -hmm. week. So mm -hmm. None of that. Okay. It was more about... We're working together because we have an opportunity here to make a big bonus this quarter. And we're all on this team together. We're working together. Interesting. So, yeah, everybody's on the same limb with, of that tree. Yeah. Okay. We're talking with Michael Houlihan and Bonnie Harvey. We're talking about their book, and I'm um, holding it up. for If you're watching us on YouTube, if you're not on our YouTube channel, you should be. And it's The Entrepreneurial Culture, 23 Ways to Engage and Empower Your People. We're here on Critical Mass Radio Show, and I'm your host, Rick Franzi. We only have a few minutes left. Um, so you discussed the golden rule. Could you share what the golden rule mm -hmm. is for our audience? The golden rule is put yourself in the other guy's shoes. And it's basically asking yourself the question, how would I like it? How would I like it if I were sitting on the other side of the table? How would I like it if I were that person that I was selling a product to or buying a product to? In other words, how do you treat other people? And what does it feel like to be on to be the, recipi or the recipient of that kind of an action or that kind of an attitude. And so we're talking about customer service, so let's use that as an example. So instead of being the person who's answering the phone for your company in the customer service department, what if you're on the other end of that and you're the caller and you're saying, you know, I've got a real problem. And you realize what it would sound like if you had that problem and the person that was answering the call was just reading a script for mm -hmm. instance. Or if you had to go through a real tree and punch in this and punch in that, and by the time you actually get a human being, 15 minutes have gone by, and all the information that you've entered is completely gone, and you have to start over. That is the Now, worst. how does that feel? <laughs> I can tell you how that feels. It feels bad. Yeah, you're putting yourself in the other guy's shoes. Right. So when you're doing that, then you have empathy for that 
person that you're doing business with. And that's really essential. Right. I, yeah. think, I, I think that's great, Bonnie, because I think sometimes you put good people in those jobs, but if their systems aren't capable of transferring knowledge, you know, I'm going to transfer you to the next person, and then the next person asks you for the same information the first person asks you for, over time, they have to become desensitized to it a little bit. And then all of a sudden, I think they become a victim sort of of the fact that your company didn't set the culture and the systems mm -hmm. upright to empower them to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I think even good people then descend to tend to kind of dumb it down a little bit just because oh, I've heard this so many times today, you know. I know you don't want me to have to ask you the same information, but I don't have it here, right? <laughs> so they're, they're sort of, your own employees are victimized by bad systems thinking. And, and what's really sad is the people who are actually working within those bad systems never tell their bosses how people complain about the system itself. Mm. Mm -hmm. right. See, it's one thing to complain about the product. But how about complaining about the way you've been treated? Right. That's the one that they really should work on first. Right. So you mean complaining about the complaint department? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. We, we think that you should, when you call a company up, you should get an ombudsman. This person says, "I'm going to, I'm going to see your problem through, no matter how many people we have to talk to." Okay. You yeah. You just sit there, and and I'll and I'll handle it. I'm like your advocate then. Yeah, that's right. So they, so you have an assigned. And the other thing we need to do is when people call, we need to need triage them. We have to say, "Is this a person who's called before?" If so, let's make them a top priority. Right. Is this a person who has a complaint that we can call back about? So this is triaging. This mm -hmm. is why, you know, they do this in the military. You know, is this person is this person savable? Is this person walkable? Whatever. Right. We need to do that. And when we do that, we're going to stop exacerbating the problem when people call and they get mistreated. Right. That's excellent. I wish we had more time, but we don't. But last question. Where are you guys now? What are you up to now? I mean, you're here in Southern California. We talked about why you're down here, but what else are you doing? Well, we've been doing a lot of things. In the past two years, Michael and I have spoken to a number of universities that teach entrepreneurship, and we're really enjoying that, talking with the students and also the faculty about entrepreneurs and, and how to get started in a business, particularly trying to alleviate their fear of not having enough money or not having enough knowledge of their industry when they start off. Because after all, that's how Michael and I started. <clears throat> We started without money and without knowledge of our industry and created one of the fastest selling wine brands in the nation. So it's possible. Right. That's one of the things we're doing. We're also talking at a number of conventions. We were at the cust customer experience convention that was uh, hosted by the conference board in New York City. And we were executive in residence at the University in Lethbridge in Alberta, Canada. And we were also um, in Dublin, Ireland, weren't we, Michael? Yeah, we were the uh, keynote speaker at the World Conference on Entrepreneurship. Wow. So uh, we're doing all that. Blast. The other thing oh, that we're doing is we're writing you know, hundreds of articles uh, that are in uh, professional journals across the United States. And we've also taken some of these ideas that we've discussed here today, and we put them into uh, infographics. Okay. And they're free, and they're downloadable at www barefootbonus.com so if you go to barefootbonus.com you can download these infographics that you'll be able to see visually uh, graphic rep representations of some of these ideas and we've we spent a lot of time trying to simplify these for people right so I think they'll get a big kick out of it you know the two division company the seven sales uh -huh. uh, all this stuff great you know how to make mistakes right are your books available on that site as well, or yes. should they go somewhere else? Well, they can, they can go. To, the site has everything. There. Okay. Yeah. So if they want to buy your books and learn more about the barefoot spirit or the entrepreneurial culture, they can find that out by buying your books and reading them, right? Absolutely. Well, I hope they enjoy them, and I, and I hope they give us a good plug. Me too. I, it's been a pleasure, as always, having you two back in the studio. I so, feel so fortunate that you're here today and in Southern California. Hopefully, you'll be back in the not-too-distant future, and we can continue this conversation. Bonnie Harvey, Michael Houlihan, thank you for being friends of this program and part of our critical mass business community. It's our pleasure, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I hope that all of your business decisions will move your company in a positive direction.